welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. In our celebrity lecture series, we have been blessed with many guests who have been there and done that in a wide variety of fields. Today's speaker is no exception. She has been in the midst of some of the most fascinating and inspiring developments and achievements in the world of aerospace. Even so, having been there and done that is just not enough for her. Jill Rutan Hoffman still has far to go. She has mapped out an ambitious and admirable plan, not only for her own future, but for the future of many others. Best of all, the others she is talking about are the same youth who are so important to us here at the Western Museum of Flight. Those youth, of course, are the potential future pioneers and visionaries who will carry our technology and industry into a bright new world that we cannot even guess at. So to share some of her vision and the plans of action it will take to get there, it is my privilege to introduce Jill Rutan Hoffman. Hi, everybody. Wow. Wow. Thank you for making me feel so at home by having me speak in a hangar. Because <laughs> seriously, this is where I grew up. I, I don't feel at home really anywhere else but in a hangar. And I'll tell you a little bit more why that is true. Now, I usually don't speak with slides. Uh, so this is a first time real treat. And it caused me to find pictures to share with everyone. So these are unseen pictures from many, many years ago and very personal family pictures um, that I'm excited to share with you today. So I'd like to start off and introduce you to the Wright brothers. Some of, them, some of you guys might know them, Orville and Wilbur. But the neat thing about these guys is they were bicycle mechanics in Dayton, Ohio. Just two guys repairing a bicycle, running a small business, it's fantastic. And then one day, Wilbur's out, kind of taking a break, and he happens to glance up at the sky, and he sees a bird fly over. All of a sudden, he has an idea. He grabs an inner tube, like a, a, a tire box, and runs in to see his brother Wilbur. He says, Wilbur, or Orville. <laughs> Orville, I know how. I know how to fly. I know how we can do it. And he holds up the box, and he shows them. He says, all we do is manipulate the wings. That's all we have to do, as they called it, wing warping. Wow. From looking at a bird, idea, wing warping. I can control the airplane. I can steer it. Therefore, we can fly. Now, think about that for a second. If Orville said, oh, you're crazy. Go back and finish doing what you're doing. You need to sweep up this, the, the trash over here, and we have four bikes that came in today that you need to fix. Okay? But I'm fairly confident that Orville didn't do that. Orville said, tell me more. So that night, I'm sure these two boys went to dinner, and they were sitting there with their family, and let's say they were eating meatloaf. Really, you can't. There's no documentation of what happened that night. So the boys are sitting there with the family, and Wilbur looks up and says, Dad, I think I figured it out. You know how these people are trying to fly? But they're not successful because they don't know how to control the airplane. I can control the airplane. What if his dad said, oh, for crying out loud, Wilbur, did you finish the four bikes and the shop is a mess? Fairly confident they didn't do that. They said, tell me more. Because if they had told him he was crazy, Wilbur likely would have went, yeah. You're right, that's, that's a silly idea. It won't work. And he would have went back to building bicycles. Let me introduce you to two other people. This is George and Irene Rutan. Or as I like to call them, uh, grandma and grandpa. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna get uh, very verklempt when I talk about uh, grandma and grandpa, or as a lot of people know them as mom and pop rutan. I feel like these people are a lot like the Wrights family. 
because George, or Papo, spent a few years in the Navy, and when he retired, he got out, used the GI Bill, and uh, became a dentist. He and Irene raised two boys, rambunctious boys, and one lovely daughter. <laughs> one day, one of those rambunctious boys came up to her and said, Mom, I found a bunch of old boss wood in the garage. Look what I built. And she said, what is it? And he says, it's an airplane. I think I've designed a better airplane. Now, some mothers would say, oh, well, did your room cleaned? Come on, n n quit that nonsense, you have homework to do. And other mothers might go out in the backyard and toss the airplane around to see if it would fly. Not Irene. Irene was so excited and so supportive of that rambunctious young man that she strapped that balsa wood model onto the roof of her car. And then they drove it. They found an empty road, country road out someplace, and she took that car and drove it as fast as she can down the, run, down the road so her boy could see the effects of wind over his airplane and see how it would work. Ha, huh. that's a true mom right there. Oops. And because of what she did, I have a very fabulous family history. Now, I do a lot of speaking for STEM education, and uh, I want to get kids involved in aerospace and STEM, and I want to make sure that they continue to look skyward, that they're always looking up and wondering. And when I speak to these kids, I ask them, what represents your family? Do you have something that says what your family's all about, something that's passed down from generation to generation? And some kids raise their hands and says, yeah, we have a, we have a photo album. Someone else, oh, this is this duck. This duck that my great-grandfather carved, and it's just, just a part of our family, and it, t it tells the story of our family. But one of the common things is, they said, we have a quilt. We have a family quilt. Each patch of this quilt represents a time period in my family's life. It's the story of my family. And for generations to come, they can add another piece to the quilt that tells another piece of the story. This is my family quilt. This is an air show jacket, and it belonged to my grandmother, Irene Rutan. Now, Irene loved the fact that her boys were so interested in aviation, and she followed them everywhere they went. She was always on the flight line, uh, counting airplanes and meeting people and sharing her boy's story. And with each air show, which each event, she'd buy a patch and sew it onto her jacket. I love that jacket, and the thing it says, if found, returned to Irene Rutan. And also in the pocket, it's, the pockets are sealed with a little safety pin, and there's patches, tons of patches in the pockets that she ran out of room to sew onto the jacket. That was willed to me, and that's my most prized possession. That is my family quilt. Let me introduce you to two more brothers. See, this is Dick and Bert Rutan or as I know them as Dad and Uncle Bert. Bert, the one with the beard, he was that rambunctious young man with the balsa wood. Now Dad, the one that looks, I think, a lot like me, don't you think? There's the, see the, have you seen it now? That's me. When Bert was out building balsa wood airplanes and balsa wood models, Dad was riding motorcycles. He was the daredevil. Dad wanted to go as fast as he possibly could. These guys are quite a team. When they're ever anywhere near each other, you'll see them engaged in a real heated argument. Um, every Christmas, we will de would debate who really killed Kennedy, or <laughs> how to get to Alpha Centauri, or what's the best way to go from our galaxy and beyond. Nothing is impossible to them. Uh, they just have these outlandish ideas that I was raised with. It, it, it seemed normal to me. Now, when they get together, magic happens. Many years ago, during they were having a lunch together, they would sit down and have one of their, their famous argument discussions, like two brothers do. But Dad came to Bert and said, Bert, I'm ready to do something really exciting. Now, see, Dad's always doing record-breaking things. He's flown up the world's tallest waterfall. Yes, up 
the world's tallest waterfall. He has flown course, close course distance record. He held, holds a lot of uh, aviation's records. But dad was hungry for a little bit more. And he said, Bert, I want to get involved with air racing. I think I can, I can revolutionize the entire sport. I can build the fastest plane out there. And Bert, you know, he kind of thought for a second and said, you could do that. Or, have you ever thought about flying around the world, nonstop, non-refueled? Dad says, huh. I mean, Dad knew that it had never been done before. Many have tried, but nobody succeeded. There was definitely not an airplane out there that was capable of doing that. And again, I should mention, that was 29 years ago. Well, oh, more than 29 years ago. 32 years ago. So world flight was completely unheard of. It's impossible. But Dad didn't say that to Bert. He didn't say, Bert, you're crazy. The hangar needs to be cleaned. Just go <laughs> finish your meal and go on. No, Dad said, tell me more. And the really spectacular thing about the family is Bert pulls out a paper napkin and lays it on the uh, table there at the restaurant and starts sketching the airplane that would be capable of such a journey. The thing I love about my family is that anyone else would have stood up and said, oh, we don't have any money, airplane doesn't exist, yeah, seems like a lot of work. Or they would think it was a really good idea and fold up the napkin and put them in their pockets. I mean, how many great ideas have you had that never came to fruition? Uh, mine is the squeezable ketchup bottle. <laughs> Only I spoke up with that. You know, we sketch things, I do it all the time, sketch things and find the next great idea to revolutionize the world, and I fold up the, pocket, the napkin and I leave the restaurant, oh, and somebody cuts me off, or the phone rings, and there's, oh, I, I need to attend to that and this, and I don't find the napkin for another 30 years after I'm giving the jacket away, right? But not these two. See, Bert, Bert knew what he was talking about when he designed an airplane, because those balsa wood models went into a, a company that he created called the Rutan Aircraft Factory, or better known as RAF. Now, RAF was located on the runway of, Mojave, of the Mojave Airport, and Bert thought, well, this is a better way to design and fly an airplane. These are three of his first airplanes. Um, on the top is the Very Vigan, followed by the Very Easy and the Defiant. Now, the neat things about this, these airplanes are you could buy the designs of this airplane and build it in your garage. Now see, I'm talking to an audience that's very well aware of home builds. Most of my audience say, you're gonna what? You build an airplane in your garage? I go, yeah, not only that, they used to build them in my living room. <laughs> but see, the boys built it in the living room, but they couldn't figure out how to get it out of the living room. So, cause I'm thinking if they asked us ladies, we would have figured out how to get it out of the living room. It's true. <laughs> But Bert went on to design hundreds of airplanes, but these are his most notable. So after the napkin, Dad didn't put it in his jacket. He went home and spread it out on the table and shared it with his co-pilot, Gina Yeager. He says, I think we can pick the last plum off the tree of aviation. I think it's possible for us to fly around the world without stopping. And Gina was one of the crowd, just like the Wright family, and went, okay, tell me more. They spent 18 months scraping every dime they had together. I mean, I, again, I think a lot of people, you have a great idea, but you don't have the money for it, so eh, let's wait until we get the money. Not these two, and myself. I spent most of my summers walking around air shows with my hat in my hand, going to people and saying, would you like to donate some money so my daddy can fly around the world? <laughs> a lot of people laughed at me. Because again, early 80s, late 70s. That was impossible. Nobody flies around the world. Uh, some people donated $2 and said, don't laugh, I haven't had lunch today. I mean, if you did that today, and you had an idea for an airplane, what would you do? You would do a Kickstarter program, wouldn't you? You could ask for money online, and, and you'd likely get it, get large sums of money. But this is, be this is before, really, computers were, were in everybody's house or on everybody's wrist. They begged for every dime. Now, corporate sponsors came to sponsor the airplane, 
And dad just, it, a lot of the tobacco companies came and they said, hey, we got a great idea. You put my company name on the side of your airplane, we want you to take off from Caesar's Palace parking lot. Yeah, and you do that world thing and you come back and land in the parking lot. It's gonna be great. That says, yeah, I can't have any self-respect if I do that. I just, I, it, it just didn't feel right. So he accepted no corporate, corporate funding, it was his airplane. And the airplane was, was funded by people like yourself that would walk by and again, give a dollar or go visit uh, and drop a 50 cents in the jar. Uh, people showed up from all over the world. Uh, in fact, one of the crew chiefs named Bruce Evans showed up, didn't tell anybody the history. Nobody really knows where Bruce was from, uh, but Bruce was with us through the, through the whole building and creation of the airplane. But we were on a tour after the flight and he always made me go through customs before him. He says, Jill, don't go through customs with me. I'm like, Bruce, you're crazy. Um, if you ever meet Bruce Evans, don't go through customs with him. <laughs> You'll get detained, just a, a skosh. Great guy, um, but and he might have been playing a trick on me. Uh, but these brilliant minds that were kind of hiding in the shadows came out and helped build and design this airplane for no pay, just to see if it was possible, just to see the spirit of aviation come alive. Edwards Air Force Base, California. Is anyone familiar with Edwards Air Force Base? Yeah, it's where the shuttle used to land. It's in the middle of the desert of nowhere. It's where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. Poncho Barnes, the first flight of every great airplane out there, I would say, arguably, started at Edwards Air Force Base, California. So Dad could think of no better place to start his journey to make history and the, the dry lake bed was kind of a plus, plus too. Because if you see in the lower right-hand corner, uh, that's the actual base, and you see those two runways. And the longest runway out there towards the bottom of the screen, uh, that's runway uh, four or two, two, depending upon which way you come in, uh, it falls out into a very big open space. So you have a lot of options to abort that takeoff run. And with such a long, home-built, oddly designed airplane, you're gonna need a lot of runway to go. Now see, they took them 18 months to build this airplane, a little bit more to, to raise the money. And when this airplane was built, Dad stands back and realizes how unstable it is. The airplane was so thin that you could stand on one end and kind of jiggle the, the wing and the other wing would just jump up and down crazy. As you were building it, if you laid your elbow on it too hard, go right through the wing. In fact, you could take a pencil and jam it right through the wing. It was a very, very fragile airplane. <laughs> and a little scary. So he spends all this time, I had this great idea, I'm gonna fly around the world. I built my airplane and now I'm at Edwards Air Force Base and oh my God, I built an airplane that I have to fly around the world in. And uh, he was scared, it wouldn't even come off the runway. They had some test flights, which they lost a prop during one of them, it's, it was very challenging. But Dad couldn't quit. You guys raised the money and, and made it happen. I mean, he would never have climbed into the cockpit of that airplane if a tobacco company was funding him. Because again, he was very confident, to the point where he even videotaped a, a message for everybody that if, in, if, if it ends badly, that no one was allowed to sue the company or to do anything, and it was all for the spirit of aviation, which I didn't know about until about two years ago. So <laughs> I'm glad I didn't know about it. But there he sat uh, on the end of that runway. Now see, the night before, he and Gina, they were both really sick, really sick. So they had this small window. You know, you have to make sure the weather's just right, and they had a small, small window to go. Dad had a really bad cold, and Gina, Gina wasn't feeling well at all. So they had about four or five days where they could go. And they're staying at the barracks there on Edwards Air Force Base. And every morning, the flight surgeon would come. And Dad would open the door, and he says, hey, weather's bad, we're no-go today. And then Dad would climb back into his bed, go back to sleep. Next morning, Dad gets up, opens the door, no-go for weather. Dad would go, okay, climb back into his bed and go to sleep. That particular night, tossed and turned, didn't feel good, just really the worst that he's ever felt. Next morning, 
And dad crawls out of bed and says, God, please give me one more day. Please let there be weather. Opens the door. Hey, Dick, we're good to go. Now see, the reason he wasn't sleeping the night before is having this recurring dream that he'd make it all the way around the world and he'd run out of gas just coming up the coast of Mexico. And he wouldn't be able to make it. Recurring dream. So he went that night before and filled a little bit more gas. Just topped her off a little bit. Apparently the crew chief also had the same recurring dream. Good old Bruce. So the morning of the flight, Voyager was very well fueled to the point where the, the wings of the airplane uh, hung down on the, on the runway when it was time to take off. Ah, you know, they de-iced the airplane, Dad's sitting there looking at the end of this very long runway saying, as he likes to say, I don't know what the next five minutes of my life is going to be like, but here we go. We're going to go. Now see, I was on the other end of that runway really fun 16-year-old, really loving all the attention. Look at all these, all these people are here, and Dad's going to go do another flight. He's done them all my life. All my life. So I'm standing there with Pop. You guys remember Pop from the first line. Now, Pop said when Dad was going to go by, when the Voyager team goes by, the airplane's going to be about this high off the runway. Okay. Well, Voyager went by, and Voyager was not this high off the runway. I just thought Pop was mistaken, no big deal. But what Pop knew that I didn't know is that as Dad was taking off the wing tips on this very unfragile, unstable airplane, bent forward and were scraping on the runway as he's going through, so it was preventing him from taking off that fateful day. Now Pop's standing there knowing that he's about to see his son end horribly as he stood there holding the hand of his granddaughter. Now, I never, thought, I never saw it through his eyes at the time until many, many years later. But that's a family that supports each other. Pop never let on that they were concerned that they, would never, that they weren't gonna take off. But I have good news. Because dad, you know, he's got that golden arm Vietnam fighter pilot, even though everybody told him back in the chase plane to abort the takeoff. And if you, you can find some of the videos on YouTube where they're yelling at him, you know, abort, abort, abort. But Dad's a little stubborn. But he, he knew that airplane. He's built that airplane. He's touched every piece of that airplane. He knows it inside and out. So he knew at just the right time when to pull back. And that bird, that big, beautiful bird, the wings started lifting off. And off they went to fly around the world without stopping. Now that's through bad weather over hostile countries they'll shoot you down <laughs> in a home-built airplane. And there it is. Now you can see the wingtips are damaged. As they took off, the wingtip on the left was clean off, but the other one was kind of flapping in the wind and they had to do a little maneuvers to make that thing rip off. And the only thing that I was worried about during his flight is that a little piece, it was gonna pierce one of the 17 fuel tanks of that airplane and there would be a drip, 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 and his dream would come true, he'd run out of gas. But there they go, they start their journey. If you notice, of course, the cockpit's right there in the middle, and you can see the little bubble, and it looks like a kind of a head sticking out of the bubble there. This is a little bit more of the cockpit. Now this is Gina. Now if you remember, let me go back how unstable that airplane was. So when they would do the test flights, Dad would watch the wings go up, and then they'd go down. And then they would go up, and then they would go down, and it would start to get worse and worse and worse. And one of the test flights, he asked uh, Bert, um, how far can these wings flex before there's going to be a significant structural damage? <laughs> and I think Dad just didn't want to know the answer, so he shut off the mic. <laughs> but here's Gina in the cockpit. Now, Gina, Gina didn't have the strength to control such a behemoth of an airplane because the autopilot couldn't control it. And Gina really, she did not have the upper body strength to do it. But Gina played a very crucial, crucial role in being on this flight. Because dad, 
you know, that Vietnam fighter pilot that got him off the runway also makes him a very stubborn gentleman. So dad knew that Gina couldn't fly the airplane, so he stayed awake for three little close to four days flying the airplane because the weather was bad. Uh, and, but Gina was there to make sure that dad kind of stayed in check with everything. Uh, she controlled the numbers and uh, she had a lot of other tasks that made the flight successful, but I'm convinced that if that was two men there, uh, there would have been a little bit more conflict uh, around the world than there actually was. But here's a secret. You ready? This is what you get from the daughter that you won't get from anybody else. About a month before they took off, they quit speaking to each other. <laughs> So Dick and Gina hate each other. So it was quite interesting close quarters. You can see how tight that was. Gina actually laid down, but she couldn't sit up in the back. So they would swap places. So Gina would have to scrooch all the way up to the front as dad would kind of lift himself out and shimmy back behind the airplane. And you can see over his head, he couldn't see out of the airplane. So in order to see out, he had to lift himself up, kind of look around and down, I mean, other than the little side things. But I couldn't imagine not being able to, to see the horizon or anything around you as you're in constant fear of that engine noise stopping. As the airplane porpoises up and down and you're flying over vast oceans in the dead of night. In fact, uh, there was a story, and he's convinced that this person was kind of an angel. My father is not a religious man, but he's convinced he's an angel because right before they were going to take off at Edwards, there was a young airman that came in and said, I want you to take this. And dad looks down, and they were night vision goggles. I mean, they didn't take anything on the flight. It was bare minimum because our STEM student, uh, what happens if, you, if an airplane's heavier and heavier? What, what do you need to have it go? I'm putting you on the spot to keep going. If you have a air, heavy airplane, you need more fuel to get it to go, right? So they cut everything. There was nothing. So when this airman came and handed him these goggles, dad really had to think about, is this something, is this worth the weight to risk flying around the world? In fact, if you notice in the pictures, the first picture, Gina had this beautiful, long, dark hair. But right before the flight, they cut it all off. And they weighed her hair. And dad held it up and said, this would cost seven nautical miles. He said, so if we crashed, I would have to swim another seven miles <laughs> because of her hair. So it was a crucial, when this night vision was handed to him, when he thought, well, what the heck, I'll just, eh. just a decision last minute. Well, as he's flying through the dead of night, through thunderstorms, he remembers, I have night vision goggles. Now again, I mean, the technology we have on airplanes today is fantastic. It would make the trip a lot easier, but that was his cockpit. So he would shimmy himself up, look through those night vision goggles, and he would time himself for just a, every night, just time it, just for a short, tiny second and he would try to remember where the clouds were, and then he would turn them off and then save them because he realized how important those were. He could, it was crucial, but he described it as if you were standing in front of a forest of trees, and you look at the forest of trees, and you try to memorize where they are, and then you put a brown paper bag over your head, and you run like crazy through the trees just on memory of where those trees were. Um, that, and so, the story, and that is probably one of 300, oh my goodness, stories uh, through the flight. But the one I really want to share with you today is dad was fatigued. I mean, when you have a constant fear that any second you're in danger, as I'm sure a lot of you uh, would have stories and could relate, you no longer feel hungry or thirsty or tired. You're just fearing for your life, basically. So he didn't eat as much as he should have. He didn't drink as much as he should have. He was just trying to fly that airplane. But there came a point in time when he called Gina, and Gina, get up here. He says, the instrument panel is bowing out. Help me push it back in. And I'm sure Gina went, oh, God, here we go. Help me push it back in. So we had episodes of that, and then there was a gremlin 
there's a gremlin that goes with my dad on all, all of his flights, his close course distant records when he's flying for a long period of time. And the gremlin sits on his dash and talks to him. And this gremlin, this particular evening, said it's imaginary, of course, but it's real in his head. They said, listen, Dick, you've died. Look down there, you've crashed. All you have to do is go to sleep. That's it. Go to sleep. It will all be over. It's all you have to do. And then he says he heard his mom's voice. It's back to Irene. That said, Dick, you've never quit before in your life. You're not quitting now. So that gave him strength to ignore that gremlin and to continue on with the flight. <sighs> Love that lady. Nine days. It took them over nine days to fly around the world. Now think about sitting in your chair. How long could you sit in that chair? <laughs> Not very long. I mean, I, I can't sit in a chair for longer than 15 minutes. And next week, I or next month, there's going to be a U-2 pilot, and they could probably sit a little bit longer, 12 hours. My husband used to fly the U-2, so I, I know that fairly well. But nine days, over nine days, there. Oh, and you're constantly in fear that, you know, your engine's going to quit, which they did, and that's a whole other story. Um, this is their route that they flew. I don't know if you could see it very clearly, but they didn't go up over the top of the, the world. They actually went around the center of the world, uh, along the equator. Interesting stories where they flew over a hostile country, and, you know, you have to talk to the guy on the radio, and he says, well, where'd you take off from? Edwards Air Force Base. Um, type of aircraft? Experimental? Where are you going to land? <laughs> Click. <laughs> Please don't find me. Um, so that's the route that they did. So you can see they went a distance of just over 26,000 miles. Now see, when it was time to come home, when it was all said and done, Bert, Bert wasn't sure if he'd ever see his brother again. It was really funny because Bert always says, you know, nobody ever asked me to prove anything. Which always kind of concerns me a little bit. Go, what do you mean, Bert? Nobody asked you to prove it? What? But Bert also thought that there was a very slim, slim, slim chance that they would, they would make it back. So when they came back flying up the coast, they went out uh, to look for him. And Bert tells a very emotional story when the chase plane is there and they look for him. They said, Dick, Dick, do you see my strobe lights? I said I wasn't going to tell the story because it always gets me choked up. Uh, and then Dad turned on his strobe lights. And then Bert did exactly what I did. Because they realized they did it. They did the impossible. And not once did anybody sit around and go, ah, oh, it's ah, maybe you shouldn't do that. Just my aunt, ironically enough, she wouldn't let me do, you know, the welcome pictures and things, a little superstitious. I had no doubt in my mind they were coming back because dad always came back. After doing a brief air show over <laughs> uh, Edwards Air Force Base, a couple of flybys, they successfully landed after their journey and they went into the history books. Now think about being in a cockpit for over nine days. What happens to your legs? Like when you get off, and, or even after a long movie, when we sit in those recliners, I can't walk. I couldn't imagine being even in a recliner for nine days. But Dad, again, that golden arm fighter pilot says, no one's taken me away from this airplane in a stretcher. I'm going to walk away from this airplane. So he did what every good fight so, but when he's sitting there, we all know what he was doing. He was trying to get feeling back in those legs of his. And mind you, they couldn't throw anything overboard to include all their waste and everything. So dad walked around after it was confirmed that they actually did complete the world flight, uh, did, his, did his checks, and then he allowed them, okay, I can go get debriefed and we can go to the, the hospital now. On the way to the hospital, in the ambulance, you see how skinny they are. Dad is just euphoric that he, he succeeded, he's, he's alive. I think that's really what it was. But through the journey, I mean, Ronald Reagan was speak, talking about him. He was on the weather, the Daily Weather Channel. You know, the weather for Voyager today is... Dad had never been exposed to anything like that before. Everything that he did was just in the aviation community. He just wanted to know if it could be done. Yeah, 
I want to break a record so I can encourage somebody else to break that record. He gets very mad if his records stand for longer than a few years. Doesn't like that. A record is made to be broken. That's progress. But he says, you know, he calls me over and he says, Jill, what are all these people doing here today? There were thousands and thousands and thousands of people that came out to the lake bed that day. But he says, why are they all here? Is the shuttle landing today? <laughs> so I love that. It was for the pure spirit of adventure. Not to sell tickets. Uh, <laughs> I always pick on Red Bull. Not to sell some Red Bull but just to see if it was possible to advance aviation, much like the Wright brothers did and Glenn Curtis and the people uh, before them and after them as a way to move us one step further to adventure and exploration. Voyager, the shuttle landing today. Now see, Voyager is going to celebrate its 29th birthday this year. Wow, 29 years just in a blink of an eye. Now, see, my husband and I, we were active duty for 20, 26 years, just retired, went into the civilian life, uh, moved out to Palos Verdes, California. But when we were uh, stationed at Edward, uh, we were stationed in D.C., Dad would come and visit me quite often, and he'd do two things every time, every single time he'd come to D.C. He would take my kids to go visit a few friends of his. <sighs> every single time. He goes and visits his three friends at the wall. Those girls are now, one just got accepted to college and the other one's working for IBM, yay. <laughs> he's always amazed that there are people around the Vietnam Memorial. He says, what are all these? He's always amazed that there's crowds, but he's always quite touched that there's people there every single day at the wall visiting his friends. Then he visits his airplane, which now hangs in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And he stands there under this airplane, even after all this time. And he looks up and he says, you can take anything away from me that you want, but you will never take away the fact that I built that airplane and I flew it around the world. And he stands there very quietly. And to this day, it amazes me. People in all languages, all around the world, are pointing up, talking about this airplane that flew around the world that two people successfully built, funded, and flew around the world. And he won't let me tell anybody that he's there. Although, I always do. <laughs> so I tell you, next time you're in Washington, D.C., and you're in the Air and Space Museum, be sure to look to your right and to your left, because the person that did the most amazing thing of the airplane that's right in front of you could be standing right next to you, not letting their daughter tell anybody that you're there. Dad also knows the importance, like I said with his records, he knows the importance of sharing this spirit with future generations. That's so all he does now, and if you see Pop, Pop's there on the right uh, participating as well. It's important that our next generation has the courage to do something that people think is impossible. He, they need to have people around them that says, if you can prove to me why this would work, I support you, because nothing is impossible. I hear it too often, people say, come up to me and say, oh, my son always wanted to fly, but I told him he could never fly. Oh, it's the most devastating thing in the world to me. You see, I, grew, I thought I grew up where everybody had an airplane in their garage. I mean, everybody wanted to go to Alpha Centauri. I mean, people exploring Mars and colonizing Mars, yeah. Um, thank goodness for Elon Musk. <laughs> it wasn't until about, I was about 26 years old, that I laughed and I was sitting around some other Air Force wives. You know, we all sit around, you bring the kids, the leftovers in your refrigerator, and you sit around and talk about the week and gossip a little. And I was sitting there and there was these two ladies across from me whispering to each other and they said, there's a nut job up the street. I go, a nut job? Really? Do tell. So does he sing at night? What does he do? Does he wear funny clothes? Who, who, what's wrong with him? And she goes, yeah. He's building an airplane in his garage. <laughs> yeah, but what makes him weird? <laughs> and that very moment I realized that what I experienced in Mojave and, and, the, and the family around me is a very unusual, an unusual thing. But it shouldn't 
go away. There needs to be more heroes. There needs to be people out there that are going to break dad's records. And I tell my younger classes that if you look around, the people that are going to colonize Mars are sitting right next to you. I mean, my daughter grew up and she was so excited because she thought she was going to have her prom on the moon. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, she thought that was going to happen, is a little upset that it's not happening, so she's out also getting her generation. While sustainability is important, preserving our planet is very important, but she noticed that a lot of her peers are always looking down. And she's trying to get them to look up, and I'm trying to get them to look up. So next time you're around somebody that has this crazy idea, because by the way, all crazy ideas, at least 80% of the people must tell you it's crazy. And if they don't, you're not thinking big enough, and that's straight from Bert. But try to be that one voice around that says yes. Prove it. I support you, let's test it. Let's build that balsa wood model, put it on top of the car, and let's see if it would fly. So I really encourage you to go out and help these future, future, this generation and future generations to always be looking skyward. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure. What type of emergency equipment did they have, like parachutes and things? Back to the weight, uh, very little. Uh, they had a very minimal parachute, uh, a very minimal, I think there was a, a boat that if they crashed in the water, they could use the boat. But if it didn't have to be there, uh, it wasn't there as far as the regulations. And uh, they, uh, there was even an argument about seat belts. And uh, they didn't even paint the underside of the airplane because of weight. It's just crazy. So you, uh, how many gallons did they take off with and how many gallons did they land with? Now see, this is why I bring my technical thing. If you ask Bert about the story that I told you about filling the gas tank, he'll tell you a different story. If you ask Mike Melville, who's another person uh, that uh, helped with everything, in fact, Mike Melville is now one of the first civilian astronauts. He's the one that flew Sp Spaceship One for the first time. Fantastic guy. And again, I think that if any other pilot was in there, to include my father, uh, Mike had the skills to, to avoid the spinning. And if you've ever, yeah, so fantastic. But uh, uh, so they'll tell you different stories about the fuel because they all snuck it in there uh, last minute, early minute. And then dad, and the really wonderful thing about my dad is he'll, he'll be a very, he's a diplomat about it. He won't even give you a straight answer. That's a good question. Wanted to know how much did they eat every day? How much food did they bring? Uh, water. Uh, they, uh, what's the name? It was a Shackley, Shackley International. They had these the dry mixes that they could take. And Dr. Judela, the gentleman standing up in the middle, he was their flight surgeon and was very concerned about dehydration and very concerned. And they, he was on the radio all the time. They, they had things scheduled that you had every day. You had to eat that much. You had to drink that much. So, and, and dad, it was kind of hard to get them to stop and do that. Because if you think about, if I can get a little uh, silly, what happens when you eat and drink a lot? <laughs> Do you ever go hiking? I know, I mean, and you go, I'm not going to drink because I, I don't want to have to visit a bush someplace, <laughs> right? So where do you think they went to the bathroom? When dad gives his talks, uh, that's one of the questions that he used to ask all the time. How do you think we went to the bathroom? And he'd ask for volunteers. And it used to be that the young, uh, the young adult would come up and they actually had a, a it's like a plastic bag that had a circular, circular thing on the top that had sticky on it. And you just kind of had to, but he always asked for volunteers to do that. And he had to quit doing it because the kids were actually gonna very eager to, <laughs> very excited to demonstrate. So when you eat and drink a lot, I think that was in the back of uh, dad's mind. That's another thing he won't admit, but it would have been in my mind that if I do that, then I'm gonna have to climb in the back of the airplane and try to have a little privacy. Uh, but f food and drink was very important because if you got dehydrated, if the pilots were incapacitated, then they, they wouldn't have succeeded. But you can tell how thin they were when they landed. Very, very, very thin. So I'm sure Dad would go, I'd love to be back there again. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about Charles Lindbergh and how he used to cut the corners off of the map 
and he made his own shoes just to save weight. But yes, they owed cutting Gina's hair um, and not painting the underside of the airplane. In fact, they were really angry that they had to paint numbers on the airplane because that's, that's more weight. Uh, so that was, oh my gosh, the arguments between Bert and Dad were unbelievable about weight. So anything that didn't have to go wouldn't, wouldn't go at all. Yeah, how did they communicate uh, you know, all the way around the world? They had a command post that was set up in a, in a tra trailer, and we're actually trying to raise money to get it restored. Uh, and it was just uh, through the radio and um, talked to them quite I think there were periods where they couldn't talk to them uh, back and forth, but they, there was always somebody on the radio chatting with them. And you know, they'd bring people in to keep them, keep them entertained um, to make sure everything was OK. Yeah, it curious about a chase plane through the flight only when they took off and when they came back. But through the majority of the flight, no, wait, they came up and met them. Uh, they flew to some, I think a country in Africa, uh, and they tried to get up to fly to meet them, but the, the diplomatic issues, uh, people were very confused what they were doing and very threatened by it. So the chase plane was having a hard time getting to them because they had to you know, not, not tell the whole story. Uh, but most of the time, they, they were by themselves. The altitude range during the flight uh, is really well represented. You can see the spikes. So they would have to, uh, to avoid weather. They would rise a little bit. They did go through Hurricane Marge, which made, that's that little spike there to try to get around um, the weather. But they flew, they were trying to stay in the jet stream and stayed as, as low, low as they could. I mean, they didn't have oxygen, it's too heavy. Yeah. So the fuel, somebody just looked it up and they started with 7,010 pounds of fuel and they finished? With a, they finished with 106 pounds of fuel. So dad, thank you very much for that. I can't believe I don't have that on my stats. So dad would say that it would be like if you drove from here, of uh, I'm trying to think of the range of the cars, you know, all the way up uh, to Oregon. And you just had enough fuel to go around the block once you got there. And that's basically was their, their fuel. Uh, I would say it was the difference between her hair weight with the fuel, yes, and all that went into, yeah, it all, it all went into the calculations. And again, Bert would be so mad because one of the things with the record is that you have to be alive three days after it. It's really kind of funny, <laughs> but it's true. So to break a right world record, so dad wouldn't cross the street because he's like, wow, I did all this. If I cross the street, I get hit by a truck. I don't get the credit for the world record. But Bert would say that if I made that comfortable enough for you to survive past the three days, we could have, we could have taken less stuff. What was the speed? Uh, as they flew, and it was, it went back and forth, back and forth. They shut down one of the engines um, through the flight, and it was all just, just to maintain, to make it there uh, around the world. Yes, did you, did you look that up too? I actually saw it on the previous video. They said the average speed was 122 miles per hour. Okay, so the average speed was 122 miles per hour. Being a civilian funded project, how did they get the clearance to take out of Edwards, take off out of Edwards? Uh, it's just uh, Edwards and Mojave has a nice um, camaraderie with each other, and I think the leadership at Edwards Air Force Base understands the spirit of uh, aviation. And basically, if you think about it, that's a taxpayer's uh, this taxpayer's property. And Edwards Air Force Base, to this day, d d to this day, does a lot in supporting uh, local businesses, but the great, uh, local uh, like movies are filmed there and they don't charge them for it and uh, they're always there to, to offer uh, any sort of testing that somebody might have a need to test. Uh, they, they arrange it so you can have access to their facility. But the most wonderful thing, is when dad first did his flight, I would sit and listen to the talk. You know, I've listened to the talk for 30 years and he gives a fantastic presentation about the world flight. But each time that I would look at, listen to it and I'd grow a little bit older, the, the story changed to me. It meant something different. And then I would grow a little bit older and it meant something different to me. Uh, one of the things when he was landing, he gets all the way to Edwards and he thinks to himself, oh man, did I, did I ask for permission to land at Edwards? <laughs> And uh, so he does. He calls them right when he's coming in. And he's fingers crossed. 
please don't make me say mayday, mayday, mayday. He says, hey, you know, I'm here and just kind of flew around the world. I was wondering if I could land back and uh, the voice on the other end of the radio, and I did take this out of my talks because it does make me emotional, but I, the voice on the other end of the radio said, sir, we have canceled flying for today. You are clear to land. Yay, I did it without crying. But the significance, so as I'm listening to the talks, in the beginning it meant something really great, that they canceled flying and let all these people on the flight line to see the impossible made possible. But then I grow a little bit older and I'm following my husband through his Air Force career. And there was a time when he, he spent a lot of time at Edwards and he was uh, working, he was the general's executive officer. So I learned all what it meant to run a base and what it meant to cancel flying for the day. You don't cancel flying. That has repercussions for years and years and years because they have training schedules and it bounces them back. So that even became more significant uh, to me. But another funny story, because I, I think I still have y'all. Nobody's, nobody's going to sleep. Uh, we had to get up at dark 30 to be there. And we were with the crew doing our thing, helping them prep. prep. I'm exhausted. Dad took off or doing his thing. And I mean, I've been there for hours, sitting in the middle of the desert. And right before all the great stuff's about to happen, uh, a staff car pulls up, and the general and my mother gets out. And they watch it happen, and she climbs back into the staff car, and off they go. So I thought I was hanging out with the wrong parent, because she, I don't know how she did that, but Edwards Air Force Base was extraordinarily supportive. Uh, and I, if, I think if I was on the radio that day, I would say, no, sir, you're not clear to land. <laughs> Just kidding. It was grassroots. I don't think, Edwards did not have a big hand to play in the actual flight. They just opened their runway and allowed them to land there, again, because of the dry lake bed. If anything ever happened, it's a nice kind of, oops, we got to go into the dry lake bed. But as far as technical things that you would have or any government-funded things, no. Uh, it was definitely a, a civilian grassroots bootstrap to <laughs> two guys and a girl in an airplane sort of thing, and everything was just done on the fly. King, uh, Bendix King donated the avionics for the airplane, uh, but I, they, they did, they scrimped and saved for it. So anything technical that Edwards probably could have offered them, either they didn't ask or it just wasn't. Uh, and, and that's where I came from, the grassroots, the home built. You design your airplane, you build it. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm such a traditionalist that I don't like it when things get too commercial or, or too technical. I really like that pure uh, way of doing things, which I think it makes it an even more significant accomplishment. Did they exercise before the flight to get in shape? Yes, yes they did. They, uh, they had to be in peak physical condition uh, just so they could uh, sustain uh, being in that harsh of environment. Uh, and also weight was a big thing. So dad, you couldn't eat the extra hamburger or they had to make sure even their physical size was as small as it could be. And dad would joke that they offered to shave some cartilage off of his nose to save some weight. <laughs> so. <laughs> but the funny thing is that they did all this and prepared. Does anybody run marathons here? I. I trained and trained and trained for a marathon. I just worked for a long time, and two days before the marathon, I came down with a horrible cold. That is just, that's not fair. But the same thing happened to them. They were both very, very ill when they took off. Uh, but they still, they still win anyways. Oh, that would, it was the selection of a female co-pilot uh, due to weight, based on all the discussion with how important weight was. Oh boy, that's a kind of a politically charged question. I can't really. Uh, but actually, Gina was there from the very beginning. Uh, Gina and Dad were looking at building a race plane, and uh, Gina was working with the guy that was building rockets even even back then. Uh, and they met at an air show and uh, discovered they had common common interests. So Gina, yeah, she was there from from the very beginning. So it was just as much her baby as it was his. But don't tell Dad I said that because they really don't like each other. <laughs> So what was the relationship between D Dick and Gina after the landing? And no, they, uh, they do not speak. You, you cannot have them in the same room. They, they do not speak with each other. Uh, I'm trying to, Gina and I were, were quite close. So there's, I'm trying to 
uh, mend the relationship. I figured I'm the last person really that can do that. Uh, and, and see, because Gina has some stuff and dad has some stuff and it would be really a shame if they always have their stuff in separate places. But uh, Gina's an incredible human being and, and dad's an incredible human being too, but it was just, um, I would say lovers, lovers quarrel. The weight was such an important issue was the question and, and they didn't discard anything and wanted to know was that uh, for ethical, uh, you know, what reason was that to, to hang on to the trial? It's really because of the world record. Um, you can't, when he went and got into the airplane, the world record uh, aficionado, I don't know, they closed the canopy, put a tape on it, and the guy signed it. So you couldn't open any part of that airplane uh, because it would break the record. They didn't follow him around the world. So when he, the only thing is, if you stand in the Smithsonian and you look up, you might see a little yellow streak on the bottom of the airplane. But that's the only thing that left the airplane. And, and Dad was very concerned about that. He wanted to get that removed. He didn't want anybody else to remove any, anything. Uh, which I can see with it be very uncomfortable. Uh, which way did they take off? Did they go uh, the, you know, west, east, and why did they cho choose that? And you can see on the map here, it shows the whole direction. And they chose it for uh, weather, obviously, and the jet stream reasons, and the best possible way to make it around the world. Just a little clarification was asked that dad stayed up for three days straight and she couldn't fly the airplane, but she actually did fly the airplane. And yes, it was, it was through, uh, weather so when he was taking off and he was and then there it just came a point in time I mean Gina can fly the airplane I mean she wouldn't be there if she wasn't a qualified talented pilot it's just when weather would hit that airplane any sort of turbulence would cause those wings to porpoise so violently that it was very difficult for her to maintain it as it would be for I think most of us in the room <laughs> to be able to control the airplane uh, so as long as there was um, uh, the co-pilot the, the autopilot could be engaged. Um, Gina, Gina was capable, and not to imply at all that she wasn't uh, a, a talented, uh, knowledgeable uh, pilot and had every right to be there. Uh, but just when the autopilot couldn't be engaged, dad needed to be there just with the upper body strength to maintain it. But he was worried about it. I think when you, when you take off, you're worried about it. You want to make sure everything is good. So he's a little stubborn. Don't tell him I told you. Uh, but and there, the, it was interesting on the ground stations to hear him talk to you know Dick. You've got to go sleep. You've got to go get something to eat. Um, but you know, I don't know. In the end, Dad can look back and say, "Question what you want," but it's hanging in the Smithsonian. <laughs> so again, thank you, thank you so much. This is so much fun. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time. Thank you.